Hey, welcome to Comic Book News. I'm Dan Shaheen. Today we're doing our latest in a series of interviews with comic book professionals. We're going to talk to Andrew Neal, uh, a former comic book retailer. We both sold comics around the same time, around the early uh, 21st century, and uh, got to know each other. We're both out of the retailing game now, and uh, both work kind of boring day jobs, right? Where we sit around in uh, conference rooms and uh, often have boring meetings. So uh, Andrew decided to channel that uh, time and, and sort of like boredom into the art form of comics. So uh, he created Meeting Comics and uh, he's got a great website. You can look here, you can see his upcoming appearances at comic book conventions. You can get his comics uh, via subscription through Patreon. You can buy them at comic book stores. You can buy them directly. You can read them digitally. Basically, he's rocking uh, every angle in the toolbox of the modern indie comics creator. And I think that's awesome. So today, uh, we're going to have a uh, conversation and uh, see what he's up to. See what it means to be a creator in this world and see what needs to be done uh, to save the comic book industry. Now let's go talk to Andrew Neal, shall we? Hey, Andrew Neal. Welcome hey, to Comic Book News. Oh, hey, Dan. How are you doing? Awesome. Great to see you. You know what? It's a, this is a little stuffy. This is sort of like office attire, so I figured that maybe I could, a la Mr. Rogers, change into something a little bit more appropriate for comic book talk. Oh, and, God. And maybe, maybe a blast from the past of uh, your old comic book store. Yeah, I um, that's the shirt that my friend Adam Muse drew. He did the uh, Sad Animals uh, mini comic that a lot of people have seen, and uh, I had him draw the bear for me, and we reworked the logo that I designed. I love that shirt. I, I still love got one it. Of them that I mow the yard in. I love it. I wear it a lot. My daughter loves it. My daughter is like not quite three years old, but she's like why is the bear reading comics daddy so to me like that's clear design and, and that's a good question why is that bear reading comics <laughs> <laughs> I, and i love it because to me when i look at your stuff what i've always thought since i first met you i met you at some comic I think book it was at a diamond thing i think in it was Baltimore. At yeah the one diamond uh retailer meeting that i went to and I liked meeting the people that I met there, but I hated the event so much that I didn't go to any of those again. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's where we met. Uh, yeah, and I'll, what I remember most about you is like during those meetings, during those pretty boring meetings, you were drawing. You were drawing I comics. I don't remember that specifically, but considering I've done that during every meeting I've ever been in, <laughs> I, I'm certain you're correct. Right. So, um, okay, so tell me a little bit about you. Tell me how you got into comics. And what I mean by that is like, what's the first comic you really remember reading that like pushed your buttons and like made you know you're a comics guy? I don't remember not reading comics. Um, when I was very young, I learned to read on, you know, picture books, but also Archie Comics and Richie Rich, other Harvey Comics. Um, I don't have a specific one that sticks in my memory as being the first thing I read, anything like that. I'm always kind of astounded when people are able to say, oh, this is my first comic, because I don't actually remember a time when I didn't have comics in my life. I wasn't reading them. The first one that made a big impression to me was probably a mad magazine that I read earlier than I should have. Um, at some point before I was five years old that I was flipping through and I believe what was in there. And I don't remember if it was an actual mad magazine or one of those little paperback collections, but, uh, it was new products for babies. And one of them was a, like a, a hamster ball type thing that the baby's arms, hands and feet stuck out of. And it was half filled with baby urine. <laughs> and I just found that so horrifying and disturbing. I remember showing it to my mom and her it, explaining to me, this isn't real. Um, this isn't a, <laughs> this isn't a real thing. It's a joke. Uh, and probably taking the mad away from me. I don't, I don't, I don't remember the, the setting necessarily or, or anything but that, but I remember very specifically being highly disturbed by the, the baby piss bubble. 
Well, bring us back. What year would you say that was? Uh, 78, 1978, 79, somewhere in there. Um, I was born in 75. And mm-hmm. I can pinpoint before 80 because of where we lived. I remember vaguely that. But uh, I would guess I was through. I wouldn't think I could remember back past three or four, and I don't remember a lot from that period. So best guess, late out, 70s. You know, maybe it had like, a, I don't know, like a Henry Winkler Fawns cover or like a Laverne and Shirley parody or something from 78. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I've actually looked for that and not found it, but I haven't tried hard because it's not something that I have to see again. It's not like it, it kicked me into uh, – into some kind of way of thinking about comics. I also remember the little in-house ads from Harvey comics where Casper is in a three or four panel comic is talking about what he does. I think it's an ad for the Casper TV show. He's like, I can walk through walls. I can turn invisible. It's not a joke or anything. It's just him showing what he does. And uh, I, so I remember that from that time as well, but not really any specific Casper or Richie Rich stories. Yeah. I mean, those are pretty good. Um, just design wise, if you think about yes. the quality of the art on both of those t- books, sure. even for young kids or middle school, whatever, like high, a really high quality level. Yeah. And I loved them and I loved the Archies as well. And I had, I picked up ideas about the world that were not quite correct, probably from those comics. Like, uh, I know that I thought kids still ran down the street hitting a hoop with a stick to roll. It. <laughs> you didn't that do was that? Such, that was such a common like cartoon visual in the comics that I had. Uh, I don't remember if that was in the Harveys or if it was in the if it was in the Archies because the Digest always reprinted older comics. Um, I don't, Here's I just the thing: too, that- people, people our age. I think we were the last generation where they played all of the old cartoons, right? right? All the stuff in the 30s and 40s, violence be damned, you know, even racial stuff. Like, sure, sure. We saw it. So, like, yeah. things in my head, tropes and, like, um, uh, turns of phrase and ideas and stuff that are, like, clearly from, the, like, the 30s and 40s and have no bearing in modern life. Right, exactly. Yeah, there's that. There's also... Uh, I, I think I had a weird idea of what teenagers were from the Archie comics since <laughs> I was five, you know, I was four or five reading those. And, uh, it was a bit like later as when I was eight or nine or however old I was when I saw revenge of the nerds, like that's what college is, you know, right. uh, being exposed to different parts of life through media first, I guess can engender, uh, tolerance, but it also can confuse a kid. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, uh, well, it's, Archie is one of those titles too. That's like, it walks the line of like wholesome innocence. Like parents go and they go, I want wholesome Archie, but yes. all is those kids trying to screw each other. Right. Like I, I was talking about that recently with someone, um, with Max Huffman, who's a cartoonist locally who I'm friends with and who I like a lot, but I was talking about how, um, Oh, my cat's here. Um, if she jumps up in front of the screen, it's, it's not Cameo. an attack. She's just assisting. Um, we were talking about Riverdale, the TV show, which I watched the first couple seasons of and <laughs> three or four episodes into season three because I finally felt gross. Like, it's a really – I think it's a really good – use of the characters Archie is basically a well-meaning idiot like that's that's how I would describe the character he screws up all the time he's trying to do a good job but he does not and I think as long as you put that in any circumstance you can use Archie basically anywhere I Um, like one of your meeting comics that was the the uh the Harvey town Harveyville. Harveyville yeah I had to look up and see if there was a town that uh that the Harvey characters lived in and it was called Harveyville. Um, so yeah, I did a comic where that was just a parody of Riverdale. Basically it was just Richie rich banging, but the, uh, (laughs) 
while Arona, his robot maid, lifted up the couch that he was banging on. Right. The, it was anyway. It's I like the TV show, but I got to a point where I felt like. And everybody I've said this to has kind of made fun of me. Oh, did it jump the shark? Because it's so ridiculous off the boat. No, it just got slightly more uh, risque with Creepy, every... Creepy, voyeuristic. Yeah, uh, like with every season at least, I think, if not every episode. Um, it, I think they just felt like they had to make it more exciting as it went along. And... So I hit a point where the kids are at a pool party and Cheryl Blossom walks by in a bikini and heels. I'm like, this is just, this is a hair from porn. And right. I know these are adults, but they're playing kids. And I don't think I'm supposed to see this. <laughs> and uh, it, it just kind of made me feel creepy. I got to a point where I actually felt a little bit creepy and bailed on the show, even though it was basically what I wanted. I know a lot of people who love the Marvel movies and half the reason they love them is because they know the characters. You know, they grew up reading these characters. And I read those characters too, but I've probably read more Archie than I have any other corporate uh. comic. Like, I, Archie is more in my DNA than Captain America or Spider-Man or Batman or any of that. It's just, it's, it's probably a big subconscious influence on me because I have, you know, just read so much of it. I, and, I shouldn't say this, but like... Those Dan DiCarlo designs and artwork and covers and stuff, are, they're sexy. You know what I they mean? Are. But there's and, – and this is the point I was trying to get to. I've gone off on a tangent already. Um, the uh, – what I was talking to Max about was the show and how I felt kind of creepy. And then we talked about how it's not that different in some ways than what the comics saw. The kids are always uh, – the kids are always running around in bikinis and swim trunks and it's all fashion and sexy, but it's also wholesome. And I think part of that is the drawing style. Um, it's, I like cartoony art and I think cartoony art can be not just for kids, obviously, right. but I think there's also the intent. Like clearly there was an intent to titillate, like to, to, to engage the curiosity of kids if nothing else. Well, I think um, like you said, it's like a, it's like a, a really young kid's version of what they think it must be like to be teenagers. Right. So there's, exactly. there's, there's beach parties and there's, and there, you know, I want to kiss Betty, but you know, there's no STDs right. or unwanted pregnancies or, or, or whatever to spoil the fun. Exactly. And there's a, and you know, in the TV show, Betty has a black wig and a dominatrix gear at some point And, it's just like the intent that was there is not there anymore. Uh, it's not good, wholesome, but also sexy. It's more like this is for masturbation. Here's, <laughs> here's what this is. And uh, that's fine, I guess, except that they're portraying kids. Sort of. They're not. They're not even real kids in any way. It's, it's just, hmm. I don't know. I hit a point where for me the show wasn't, wasn't for me anymore. Um, and so this though explains this explains to me a lot about meeting com I, I reread the first six issues of meeting comics this morning okay right. so they're fresh in my mind and now what i see there is uh the wacky art style and fun but there's a lot of adult content right there's a lot of sex there's a lot of uh racial tension there's a lot of um sort of tension of the dad who's got to right. work a day job, but really wants to be out there like smashing the patriarchy. Um, right. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's, I have a, I tried to come up with a description of the comic that was easy for me to use when I set up at zine festivals or comic shows or when I'm sending uh, a pack of comics to a retailer to see if they want to carry it, something like that. And it's, it says basically meeting comics is about people who work together. Um, there are jokes about butts and robots, but also about how, how did I say it? It was in my mind about how we all are corrupted by our success in capitalism. Oh, and dude. yes. It's, you know, it's, it's all about real world stuff, but sometimes it's 20 times removed, you know, 
uh, it has that surreal are, layer that really yeah. it's it's only easy to do that in comics and get away with it where you can make something so wacky like a robotic HR guy right, right. And, and it's just like it just fits it just works because the art style works and these are tropes we've seen before and it's just like oh of course there's a robot here it doesn't feel out of place right yeah it's it's um I don't know when I started doing the comics I didn't have any plans whatsoever um I drew the first several literally on breaks at my day job and um as I started drawing them more oh there's my website yeah um, I want to show some of the comics while you're talking about them yeah um so as I started drawing the comics more and more I started thinking about them more and more and that meant that I couldn't just draw them on breaks um and at this point i maybe do some pencil layouts when I'm on my lunch break, but mostly I work on these completely outside of that because I put a lot more effort into them than I used to. Um, and that's evident as I went through the six, especially if you read them back to back like that, you see your progression as you change. Like in the beginning, it was clearly one shot comics, no recurring characters, just sort of right. like reflections on the banality of, of, of office work in it kind of quickly evolved into this, uh, you know, wacky cast of, of recurring characters, but that each have their own kind of themes to play into. Right. It's, um, the first comics were definitely just jokes about work. And part of the reason I say it's a comic now about people who work together instead of saying it's a comic about work is because it has moved from being about just work to being about a, a group of people. Um, I didn't have plans for characters. I just kind of doodled them. And it looks like I learned to draw over the course of the year if you look at these. But really, it was just I was scribbling with no plan and then decided to put them out there and then decided to do one mini and then decided, hey, I'm going to keep doing these as long as it's fun. And then a year later, I had six issues. And, you know, I just kind of let it happen to me even though it took a lot of effort um it's not like a magical thing that just showed up you know right. uh but it also sort of is because there was no plan for this at all i was talking to adam muse uh on your shirt uh, that guy earlier today on the text actually um because i sent him one of my comics uh that i had drawn recently for him to look at and we started talking about that 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 very thing about how the this is a really silly way to say it so i don't know if it'll make sense but if i hadn't just started making meeting comics i would never have thought of meeting comics like i could never have invented the characters in it if i sat around and thought what kind of characters would i like to put in a comic they just showed up and I kind of learned who they were as I went. And if I'd had a character behave one way in the past, I started thinking, Oh, that's what they do. You know, it, there, there are some exceptions where there's a little bit of thought behind some of the characters when they're inserted into the strip. But for the most part, you know, they're, they just show up as drawings first. And one of them says something and, oh, that one's an asshole. You know, oh, you know, there, there's Kevin, who's the dad you mentioned before, uh, showed up. And my whole idea was anarchist who has to have a job like right. that, that. So I did think about that to that extent. But that was that that that's not even a sentence. That's just a basic description was all I knew about that guy. And at this point, uh he has a band, he has a wife, he has a kid, he has his wife's brother and uh, six polyamorous IT people living in his house. His dad just died. Um, and in some ways, he's the, uh, he's the closest to me there is in the strip in some ways. Uh, I wanted to ask you in others, but he's, 
he's the wokest guy at his job, but he still fucks up a lot, basically. Like right. he he he's trying to do the right thing and he oversteps. Um, he doesn't know as much as he thinks he does. This this is how I think of myself in a lot of ways. Sure. You know, I'm around people who seem like they don't understand the world at all, and I get it but I also don't understand it. And I don't yeah, you always get like 10% more than them maybe or whatever. I, right. I, exactly. And I feel like I'm that in a lot of groups that I'm in, whether it's friends or work peers or whatever, it's, it's easy for me to trick myself into thinking I'm more aware than they are. Right. Um, even though I know full well that I'm not, even as I'm trying sometimes specifically not to do that uh but well, let's talk for let's talk for a second about yeah. your job history and pro gig so one of the things i want to ask you about like what yeah. was the first professional job in comics and i don't mean that's writing comics i mean just like in the industry in any way yeah i worked in a comic book store um for nine years and then i bought that comic book store and i owned it for 11 years and worked in it even more during that period than I had before. Um, so 20 years in comic retail from 94 to 2014. Um, and what a time so in comics that was. That was like, man, our stories parallel each other in a lot of ways. I mean, we're born yeah. in the same year. We both grew up working in comic book stores as youngsters, worked there for a long time, bought comic book stores, ran them, stopped yeah. running them. Right. Exactly. And, um, yeah, we do have a lot in common, and it's it's not a big common stack of things to have in common. Right. I mean, it's most people don't stop having a comic store and it continues to exist for any period of time. Most of the time, when someone stops owning a comic shop, it goes away completely. Right. Uh, mine has gone away at this point. The guy I sold it to didn't make it work for more than three years after, but that's okay. Uh, I would rather it still go, but. It's what are you gonna do right you got it like it's a rough world yeah exactly and you know i didn't kill myself running that store but man it was it was hard and it took me a few years after uh i sold it to get to the point where i felt like i was uh not somehow stuck thinking about it all the time you know, you do something for 20 years and get it into your routine so heavily that not doing it anymore, even if you want that, can be very confusing. Dude, I and couldn't look at a previews magazine until like this year because I stopped I talking to my, yeah, I stopped talking to my other friends in comics for a couple years because being in the group chat that they were in. Uh, with them talking about things that I had no outlet for anymore was yeah. making me nuts. Yeah, it was me making too. me nuts to uh, hear about their ordering plans or whatever. And I eventually went back uh, because I was, I was asked to, and it had been long enough that I felt like I could give it a shot. And I do, I don't participate in the same way I used to because I have nothing to say about how many of this dumb Wolverine thing should anybody order. I don't, really engage in that except sometimes to say hey what do you guys think about this hey here's something i know is going to stir you guys up and i'm posting it to be a troll you know like i do i do engage with comic retailers still on a fairly regular basis but it's not like i used to sure. uh, just because i don't have the professional engagement you know it's not there's not there's not a way for me to care about that and well, and I think both of us felt like at this stage now, we've been away from the stores and stuff like we both wanted like an intro back into comics somehow, at least that's for me. I want to be able to talk about comics and just sure. support them and, 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 and push them. But maybe well, comics tell is actually technically still part of my job. I work for a library um, oh. and I work there full time. And my position is kind of Frankenstein together out of a bunch of things. But one of the things I do is order the teen and adult comics. Oh, great. Um, so I'm still ordering comics. Um, it's just a relatively small part of my job. The budget for the year is less than two weeks worth at my store was. But it's a lot simpler, which is nice. Um, 
my at different money. channels. I assume you're not ordering like monthly floppies. You're going for like yeah, GM yeah. graphic novels, books, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's not something that I get to work on every day. I loved ordering comics. I was good at it and uh, it was a really fun part of the job for me. So I like still being able to do that, even though it's very different. Now it's more like, do I have the money to get this thing? Uh, as opposed to how many of this thing? Right. You know? Yeah, so, right. There's too many options and variant covers and everything else. And, and we're going to come back to variant covers in a minute because you have a specific role to play in that little boondoggle in the industry. Yeah, about, I, uh, I really... About your professional time really quickly. Do you got yeah, a highlight yeah, yeah, yeah. or a low light from your days as a retailer? Like um, anything that sticks out as a great or a, like a just a, that shit moment where you realize that retailing was not for you? I never loved retail. Um, I loved yeah. comics. Yes. And I was good at retail. Yeah. Um, so I kind of followed the opportunity I had, which is I worked for a guy for a long time. I was managing the store eventually and the guy I worked for um, let me know that he was going to close the store in a year. Um, and he did that because he knew I would take a really long time to find a job and he wanted to give me plenty of time. It was a really kind thing of him to do basically like, Hey, you better start thinking about this. Don't tell anybody, but one day you're not going to have this job. And I thought about it for a couple months and then said, Oh, uh, I've been sort of running this store anyway. Maybe I can own it. And I approached him with that idea. And because of the fact that we had an ongoing joke where he would die and leave me the store and I would say, oh, God, no, don't do that. He, you know, his response was, holy shit, are you sure? And I said, well, I'd like to try it um, if you're up for working on selling it to me. and. The short version of the story is that back then they didn't give loans for comic shops, but also I didn't have any collateral. I was poor. I had. I, I still don't think most people will be able to get a loan to open a brand new comic shop without. Some you could get a loan to open a comic shop, I think, if you had stuff. If you have you collateral, know? if you're willing to put your you house up, or something like that, and yeah. you can get a loan for anything. I didn't have any collateral. I had a two hundred dollar car, and I had my comic collection. And I sold my comic collection to put together the down payment. And um, it was a pretty small down payment, you know. Um, the cost of the store wound up being probably more than it would have been if I'd had anything to negotiate with. But considering what I had to work with, which was uh, at the time 28 years worth of comics that I could make into money better than most people could. Um, that was what I had to work with. And it was a good deal considering the resources that I had. Uh, it turned out really well for me. I went from never having anything other than some comics, basically, to uh, owning a business and doing pretty well at it. Uh, it. It worked out. It was a small business for sure. Anyway, uh, that's basically how it happened. But the, the two best decisions I ever made were buying it and selling it. Right. You know, the, the, there, there were, of course, there were bad moments. Um, the, the first location of the store was below street level. And there was a period where uh, there was a nightclub above us and their toilet lines got clogged. And uh, so sewage came up out of our toilet and pipes under our floor and flooded the place. We closed down and cleaned up and moved out of there pretty quickly after, but it was terrifying and gross. Um, I didn't tell anyone about it until years later, until we were out of that location. Uh, I think it happened on a Monday, so it was slow and easy to deal with. Um, there were, you know, there were, there were weird moments like, uh, the Obama Spider-Man issue uh, where there was a, a cover with Spider-Man with Obama on it and a cover that didn't have it. And the, the Obama cover was an incentive cover that I missed the incentive on by one. 
uh -huh. and found out the week that it was coming out that I wasn't going to get it and had let an entire church full of church ladies make reservations uh -huh. of this comic. Uh -huh. And I had to call them all and tell them they weren't going to get it. And they just kept calling the store and accused us of being racist and withholding this comic from them to sell for higher prices. Mm. And I eventually talked to David Gabriel at Marvel about it. And he changed his mind about sending them to me on the day before and said, you know, all right, they're coming overnight. They won't be there with your regular shipment. And I called them all back and said, okay, the comics are going to be here. They're not going to be here till middle of the day. You don't have to be here when we open. But they were all there when we opened. It was about 50 people between them and other people waiting in the store for me to get that package. The FedEx guy who brought in the overnight package just was very confused about the situation, what he was walking <laughs> in. And, uh, you know, I opened it up. I counted it. There was a letter in there that I had... I think I had asked David to write about the situation so that I could prove to them like that what you I had said was true. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was a lot of, oh, you really did, you know, it really was what you said. And I, yes, it really was what I said. It was just, uh, it was a week or two of solid, just ridiculous nonsense around one comic. And, that is the first that is the first pro David Gabriel story I think that I've heard. Uh, you know, I didn't deal with him a lot, but when I did, it wasn't bad. Um, yeah, I've heard good and bad. I've heard good and bad. And I think that when you understand that he is a person working for a corporate entity and that he's not making all the decisions that he enforces, he has some power at that's, the company. That's the key. Many things are beyond control. He does have power at the company and he can make a difference and he can help. And he did help me, but he's not Marvel. Right. You know, he's just the guy that has to work with comic retailers. But so that, that Obama incentive cover, perfect segue into the topic of variant cover comics. Okay. So first for the audience out there, there are comics you used to have, just have a cover on them. Right. And then somewhere along the line, they decided, Ooh, if we put two covers, a certain percentage of the audience will buy two. And then that went up to, oh, if I make three, maybe some of them will buy three. And now we're at the point where a new comic could literally come out with 30 variant covers. And they do it in lots of different ways. Some of the covers are, you can order as many of this as you want. Some of the covers are, if you order 10 of the regular one, you can get one of these or 25 of the regular one. And I think they go up to 500 or 1,000 yes. sometimes. Yes, they do. Uh, some of them are, if you match or exceed your order on this totally unrelated comic with the regular cover, you can order some other cover in some quantity. So there are many, lots many, of- Many times you haven't even seen that cover or any of those covers. You just have like a one line description of it to go for. Right. It. And then you have the situation where um, fans who want specific covers don't have any idea uh, that they are rarer, that they can't just go get the one that they want, uh, especially in a case where, you know, they bring in a, a really popular artist and put that artist on an incentive cover that you can only get one of for every 25 or 50 or whatever. And for a period of time, that whole manufactured rarity thing worked for, I think, every publisher that was doing it. And it got to the point like everything within comics and probably everything within every industry where it was done so much that it meant nothing anymore. And I think this is a point where uh, my friends and I just jumped into it ourselves and said, if anybody, nope, there's one more thing. There was one more type of variant cover comic that had to happen before we got there. And that was uh, store exclusive variant covers, which okay. is, Let's, I'm going to show, I'm going to share my screen again and yeah. keep, Go ahead and keep talking. Tell me the story. Tell me the story of, uh, of, of ghost variants. So most, okay, there's the Boing Boing articles, an interview with Jim Rugg, who did our first ghost variant cover. But what happened Jim Rugg, was... Jim Comics Kayfabe, fellow YouTuber. Uh, yes. Great channel. I want to put a shout out to that because that's just in the past couple of weeks become probably my favorite YouTube channel. Those guys are great. Um, 
but the so before we did this we were aware of other comic shops and by we i mean about 20 25 comic retailers who are friends um who kind of self-selected over the years that we were in the industry and got to know each other. Um, we were aware of the practice of some comic shops commissioning special covers for comics that people could only get at their store. And most of the time when this happened, the uh, it was a different colored cover or just the sketch or just the pencil uh, it wasn't anything great. Um, outside that, if it was actually a unique cover that wasn't just an altered version of the regular cover, it was usually someone who would do it for cheap and not well. So there were a good amount of variant covers for stores out there, which were uh, done by an enthusiastic local non-professional artist and yeah the sure the store knew somebody who kind of drew comics and they said you know marvel will print a, an extra 500 comics of anything if you pay them for it right exactly so i'll, I'll and, come up with a picture of the hulk that my homie drew and i'll throw it on there and i'll sell it at my store and and maybe people in the store will see it but that's about it and if you sell it for a bunch of money for each copy, you don't have to sell the whole print run to break even and then make a profit. Right. Uh, and you can conceivably do that because it's rarer than uh, the regular cover. Anyway, I hated these things. But, you know, we talked in, the, in our group about doing this, but actually paying for professional level covers, matching an artist to a cover, doing something that was actually good you know and i know good is subjective but it's also not um you know if if, if not you can, when you got a group of comic retailers together yeah, they, they can instantly go that is crap and that is good and it's and it's true and here's the thing if we have if we have a situation where we're each basically we're dividing it up by how many comics we order store by store you know, if we have a, a print run that is a thousand copies and I order a hundred of them and this is not a real situation, that means I've got to cover a tenth of the artist's charge. So we just tacked it on so and worked with publishers so that they built that in to what we paid for the comics. So we paid a hair each more per comic than we would have otherwise. And the artist actually was paid a decent amount, you know, and the first one we did was with Jim Rugg, uh, who did that ghost variant uh, Walking Dead cover with the Michonne with the Afro, um, which I approached him about specifically because I knew Jim and because he was doing a black exploitation themed comic aphrodisiac. Um, and I thought Ad it House, would be right? uh, Ad House, yes. Um, the, the stories in that showed up in. The character first appeared in the original Slave Labor Street Angel series as a guest character. And then the stories in that showed up in various anthologies. I know there was a, a meat house or two that he was in. Uh, they just kind of spread out around the place. And then collected into a book by Ad House and presented as though it were an art book of, say, 70s comics, uh, even though they were done more recently than that anyway he did the cover it worked out really well uh our further uh trick that we added beyond hiring a good artist was not telling anyone we were doing it and it really confused the publishers at first are you sure you don't want to promote this uh were you in the group still at the time i can't remember yeah in the very beginning and then i left comics like right when it first started most very okay first. okay so i believe and i was in on the walking dead cover you saw the cover and then you were out basically yeah okay got it yeah and it was a um it was an instant huge success despite the fact that nobody knew it existed and well, because of that and because of that and that really is what 
I think did it that people that suddenly there was a thing out there that people didn't know was going to be out there and they felt like they had to get a hold of it. And other retailers became curious that they hadn't been able to order the thing. Uh, to me, I was surprised that people didn't understand what it was. Clearly, this is a shared exclusive cover that we bought and paid for. But they got mad at Image saying, you know, why did you do this for them? As though it were an Image Comics initiative. Right. Um, it was just... And then you put all the work into it. You did the art direction, lined up the artists, got it going together, and right. for, fueled the fire a variant cover speculation, right? I did. I, I played a very specific part in a thing that I hate, uh, yeah. but it was a lot of fun and I made a lot of money and the, it was, it was a lot of fun. The, um, I think it was about a year into it when I quit doing it because I was selling the store right. and you know, the first few, I wasn't technically the art director. Um, I just kind of was there in the group and eventually the group okayed the idea of me um, being the main go-between on uh, the artist. And so, so, you know, so what happened to the ghost variant program? Did it just like, it, it, it faded it out her? because I mean, it wasn't new anymore. You know, yeah. it, it, there was a point at which it wasn't having the impact that it did. And um, it just needed to stop happening I, they still have it in their pocket as something that they can do and they may do something with it right um it's at this point i think you would have to have something pretty spectacular because even beyond what we did before because the uh we kind of wrecked the market you know people responded to that doing their own yeah. there was a retailer who was certain we had stolen his idea and started doing a uh I guess competing phantom variant, which was ludicrous. Um, was that it, Larry? It was. It was Larry. Uh, it was a really silly situation, and beyond all this, we didn't tell people anything about it. Well, that, we, that, that's the part yeah. I love. I mean, yeah. I I went to Bleeding Cool, and I tried to float the idea that it was it was Rory Root from Beyond. <laughs> who had set up the My Little Pony ghost fairy. Right, right. And it just yeah. fits so well in my mind. Rory had died not too long ago, and I just, I really wanted that story to get out there, but it, it right. never... The, um, I don't know. It was, I mean, I think Pete Dolan is the one who came up with most of the original idea of Main Street Comics. He's the owner of Main Street Comics. He's the president of Comics Pro now. He's a hell of a um, guy. He's a smart guy. I like him very much. Um, and he had a lot of the initial ideas for this. I believe he also came up with the name ghost variant, uh, after, after using it as just a way to describe what we were doing, you know, sneaking it out there. Said, that oh, guy's good... super nice, super creative, runs great stores and doesn't have a huge ego and head about it. And isn't like, doesn't need to be the most well-known guy, but I, I really right. always, appreciated what he had to say about it. yeah every every personal interaction i've had with pete is wonderful and um it's it's it was great that he came up with this idea it was great that that it wasn't his idea to him that it was our idea um you know it i don't know that it's something he would have i don't think it's something he would have wanted to do on his own he didn't think of it as his thing he was like hey guys what about this and it worked better that way too. You know, it wasn't a store variant. It was this secret thing that was spread out across the country. Uh, why did these I guys? It in that regard? And I also really liked the idea in my mind, it was like right before Andrew exits the industry, he wants to destroy it with the, with, with, with <laughs> the, the worst, um, the worst greediest version of a variant co covers. But, um, it was amazing. Of it was, didn't. Uh, yeah, it's it was just fully, totally my store, which Dan knows, but other people might not, was more of a bookstore and less of a collectible store. Right. Um, Me too. When I bought the store, there were a lot of back issues, but most of them were just sitting there. Uh, back issues at that time for me were dead. They were just taking up space. They were not worth what they were listed for in the guides. 
Um, most comics were dollar or quarter comics once they had been on the rack for a while. And I cleared the back issues out of the store. I did some big wholesale sales um, and didn't have back issues in the store at all for a while. I did add them back um, eventually, but in a much more specific way. Like a curate. Um, more of more curated, of a curated sure. section. Curated is an overused term, but people use that about my store a lot anyway. So right. sure, we'll go with curated. Sure. It was, you know, the store was pretty. It it had a lot of kids stuff in it. Um, it had a lot of attractive comics in it. Uh, it had people working there who cared about comics. Uh, we weren't as good at selling Spider Man and Batman as a lot of stores were, because that wasn't what we cared about. Uh, but we could sell a hundred copies of Scott Pilgrim well before there was a movie attached to it. Sure. It was, it was just a different type of store. And I went through the same process of thinking about back issues and getting rid of back issues and then bringing them back later. Yeah. And I feel that was my biggest mistake was not embracing a new way to do back issues earlier on and keeping that because what I didn't sure. realize, was that as new comics, if new comics, they go through lulls, they go through these highs and lows. And when they go low, you got to have back issues there to like, right. Suffer. Exactly. And I started bringing them back in. I think it, it would have, yes, it would have been during the, uh, we moved the store in 2008 for a second time. And like the day after I signed the lease on a more expensive store, the economy fell in on itself. Basically it, yeah. it, it wasn't literally that, but that's what it felt like. Um, having the newer, nicer space, I think helped us from falling further than we would have in a less, uh, a less nice location, but you know, it still was a strange situation to move from your expenses went up, your cash flow went down. That's exactly. a recipe for disaster, right? If, if, if exactly. not really carefully managed, the same thing right. happened. So, to so there were a few years of that within that period, I added a point of sale system which I'd wanted to do for years and which I'd actually bought at least a year earlier, but then not known where I was going to move when I found out the building I was in had been sold. Um, the, so we added a point of sale system and I was able to see real numbers on things. You can have a really great idea of what you're selling, but until you look at data, you don't really know. And one of the most thrilling moments of owning a store for me was once I hit a year of sales data so that I could actually have meaningful numbers in my system. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And I never stopped using my gut when I ordered things, uh, but once I had actual data to use, plus my gut, that was when things, I think, got a lot tighter for me. You so gotta have both. The data alone is not enough for someone who doesn't understand, understand the product really well. You gotta understand the product, and you gotta understand what it means that this artist worked on something before. Does it mean exactly. anything? Exactly. Sometimes it does. And sometimes it doesn't. You got like, there was a period when Gilbert Hernandez and, and Dylan Horrocks were writing DC superhero comics. Did Nobody people cared. No, that wasn't a thing where we needed to order more, you know, but it's, it's a, when Mike Allred went to Marvel comics, did that make a difference? Yes. Like X-Force and ecstatic. Sure. And, having a gut feeling about whether those would mean anything, uh, you know, were those were things I was working on orders for before I owned the store. Those, I don't know why those came to mind. They're not that recent, but they were, I don't know, stuck in my mind because my mind was still exciting and open at the time to remembering right. things. Right. Okay. What? Tough guy. Tough let's, guy. let's, let's take a look. I, if you're willing did you watch the Mick Gray interview? By the way, I don't. I don't assume that you. No, have. no. I good. um. Okay. Good because we did a little artist kind of quiz, a little plop show. I'm going to show you some. If this is okay with you, if it's not, yeah. I'll cut this out of the interview, right? Because this yeah. is me, like trying to out nerd you. These are like Dan's comic heroes, some of them, and I just want to okay. see. We just want to. I'm going to go through a slideshow. I'm going to share my screen again. We'll go through a slideshow, and you just try to name. Uh, the artists that you see, no pressure, no big deal. If you can't, we're having fun, right? And, and, and good. okay, on these artists as well as as we go. All right. Yeah. Cool. Oops. So let's start Where it off from. Obviously, right? 
Yeah, obviously Chrome. But 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 you know, for as much now we loved him, they hated him, they loved him again. Now I think they're back to hating him. It's you know, I I was I think Crumbs was a, a great artist, but I was never into the comics. Um, the there are a couple times in my comic where people have looked at it and said, keep on trucking. Cause I drew somebody's foot sticking way out. Like the keep on trucking guy that he drew and yeah. fair enough. I'm sure there's some influence in there. I just never really enjoyed reading his comics. Um, absolutely good artist. And absolutely. I understand people's problems with him. Uh, the, the way he dealt with women and uh, non-white people, you know, I think those are really legitimate complaints about his work. Um, I, I think it, they can be viewed through a certain lens, but there's also a lens you can look at it through that's, to me, that sort of says it's, a, it, it, it's not what it appears on the surface. It's not pro-racist. It's more of exploring these dark feelings inside of himself and, 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 and putting those on the page for people to see. I think that's a reading worth thinking about. And it's something that I think about when I make comics too. Uh, I do think about, because almost all my comics depict bad behavior of some type or another. Like, am I going to make a comic about someone doing something shitty and have people read it and think I'm endorsing that shitty behavior? Well, when I read and, it, I, I instantly saw your comic. I'm like, okay, so Andrew like wants to be in Antifa. Like that's like I read it and I'm like Andrew wants to go punch Nazis, right? And right, exactly. That's exactly. And you know, maybe I do, maybe I don't. But someone making a comic about a thing doesn't mean they want to do it. So I definitely understand your point. I don't think I fall quite on that side with my gut when looking at Crumb in the way that right. you do. But I I understand where you're coming from. Okay. Well, let's keep moving. Let's go to another controversial creator. Okay, there's Frank Miller. Um, Do you, from, are you reading comics today? Or have you read Superman? Uh, uh, I haven't read that one yet. Um, I do, since I order a good amount of uh, superhero books at the library where I work, if I read them, I tend to wait for the book collection to come in there. Um, I haven't read that uh, from... What I have heard from people whose opinions I halfway agree with, it's a, kind of a long, stretched out, Superman's a baby issue. And is. yeah, I mean, I, I think I like John Romita Jr.'s art, but I also, when I say that, I'm thinking of 20 years ago. I'm not, I haven't done a yeah. great job keeping up with him. Yeah. I'll read it, but I'm not in any way looking for anything. Well, um, catch our review. Catch the Comic Shop News review is our last video and is proving to be one of our more uh, popular recent videos. Good. The, um, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, Frank Miller is interesting because I don't think of him as an influence on me. But uh, if you look at the cover to my sixth issue, uh, I've got a copy right here. I don't know if you'll be able to. I've got show that, that in or edit it in, but I was thinking without looking at it, so I didn't want to copy it completely. I was thinking when I drew that of the Dark Knight Returns cover, where you know they're jumping in front of the lightning bolt. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I didn't I didn't use that specific pose. I didn't use the lightning bolt, but that's kind of what it was. And then the execution of it, because it's flat, black, and white, and red, kind of turned out to be a Sin City red. Very Sin City. So. Totally. I'm not like I'm not a huge Frank Miller guy, but clearly he's in there. He's in my head because I don't think you could be a comics creator of like our age and vintage without right. Frank Miller somehow having influenced. It's really it absolutely, be uh, absolutely because I did I didn't read Dark Knight Returns as it came out in 1986, but it wasn't too long after that. You know, right. it got in my mind when it was still fresh, <laughs> and yeah. Okay, well, let's keep moving. We're going to get past these. If we get the superstars, these are, this is the low-hanging fruit, Andrew. Let's yeah, keep going. Yeah, this has been easy. Yeah. That's Jules Pfeiffer. Nice. Another legend. If you don't know this guy, you're not reading enough different kinds of comics, in my opinion, right? He did some amazing stuff. Yeah, I just love the gesture of it. I love how, how, how gestural and how loose it is. Yeah, it's wonderful. That's Eisner. Um, 
a that's guy, a guy that, so that is, but it's never that? enough praise in my mind for what this guy can do. Yeah, it's um, I didn't read any Eisner until pretty late. Um, it didn't hit me the same way it does almost everyone else, but I respect it and I understand that he was doing it at a time when no one else was doing anything like it. Yeah, the it's subject the kind of, matter alone, like yes. no touching that slice of life stuff even then you know when contract with god came out who was he yeah. it was maybe p car harvey p car and that's about it yeah inarguably important there's a reason the biggest industry awards are named after the guy you think okay maybe i've gone to all right let's get a little more obscure let's try to get a little more out there bernie wrightson of course now i knew my secret theory of this is that comics retailers are ex much more adept at identifying artists than even comics creators who are so focused on their own work. They don't often like drink in as much of the, 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 the other It could stuff. be. I mean, I also was an art guy. I've got a painting and printmaking degree. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, and I've read comics, like I said, since I was reading. Um, yes. So I don't know exactly when I started knowing who made comics i do know that i was aware that jack kirby's stuff looked different than other superhero artists i don't remember when i knew his name when did you, know? you start liking it though um you know i like i said i learned to read on cartoon stuff like funny animal stuff and archie and richie rich uh i got to superhero stuff a little later than other kids um but when i was eight or nine definitely uh, the first superhero books I followed on purpose, though, were Captain Carrot, you know, uh, which was a true? DC funny animal book in the 80s. Uh, so I was more into funny stuff. But the, you know, eventually I got into some of everything for sure. All right, let's move on. That's that's uh, eight ball Dan Klaus Dan Close. I'm never sure how to pronounce his last I name. To, I say Klaus, but yeah. Okay. But yeah, that's uh, that guy's good. It's uh, <laughs> I like his funnier. I, I don't. He's like Woody Allen to me. I like the earlier funnier stuff. Yeah, and there's a a grotesqueness to his characters that I find both appealing and disturbing. Um, sweat beads. Yeah, the uh, uh, there was a a period of time where hate and eight ball were frequently mentioned together and they I think they did a hate ball tour Peter yeah. Bag and Dan Klaus and I, I was more into hate than eight ball Ooh, uh I think I think this guy is a better artist than Peter Bag maybe but I think and this is something I have decided to embrace for myself uh I like jokes I think jokes are more important than art and I can draw pretty well but in order to make comics happen on an ongoing basis i let a lot go and in a way that's a lot of what comics is um i think a, a few years ago it was jason latour who's a now he's a writer but i think of him mostly as an artist he's the artist of southern bastards but he's also the guy who's written spider gwen since it started um he said something along the lines of you know making comics is about learning acceptance of a bunch of images that aren't quite what you want them to be in service to the full story. He said it a lot better than that, but it's something that really resonated with me. I think and so. it's, I mean, I, to me, I, part of comics is storytelling. The, right, the, the exactly. quality of the rendering, it, it matters. It has an effect on the end user's experience reading it, but it's right. not, critical component you could draw as like Scott McCloud's triangle, right? Or pyramid of like right, right. realism to uh, uh, conceptualism. And there are great comics everywhere in that spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I, th I think that's accurate and I don't know. Let's see. That's uh, Hey, that's a fake Archie from mad magazine. Was that Will Elder or Wally Wood? Who was that? Enjoy. Good question. I, I, you know, I put Kurtzman, uh, I picked it as Kurtzman, but I don't know who did the inks, right? You don't know who inked it back then, uh, necessarily. I'm not sure who inked this. Yeah, I know that Will Elder did a famous 
Archie thing, but I don't think it's from that. Archie. Uh, yeah. Right? yeah. But um, yeah. But you know what? You were talking about hate too. Is I, I was just, it just occurred to me that hate almost is like a spiritual successor to Archie. It's like Archie kind of like, it's grown up Archie because it's, <laughs> it's cartoony, but it has these uh, like real life kind of like kids, the uh, living sure. life whatever yeah yeah all right let's move on oh this is hmm, this is one of my tricky ones that's art adams um, not, to, not to andrew he knew <laughs> right? no i really i really like those art adams gumby comics there's one or other two of them maybe there aren't a Winter lot fun and summer fun special two of my all time like those are on my top pantheon of like single issue comics they're way yeah up. i didn't just peg this as art adams i know the comics specifically that sure. that, yeah. that it's from but yeah well, yeah it's adams you know he drew it and then one was written by bob burden of flaming carrot right and then the other one was written by steve purcell of sam and max so they're both hilarious and surreal and crazy crazy writing and then you take art adams on top of it and it's like Mwah, it's wonderful i really like steve purcell a lot he did a a, a series of uh comics called koi box which were just in some anthologies uh, that were kind of this little creepy goth girl and a rat. Um, yeah. I like them. I like those a lot. I think he had, I don't know if he still does. There was a point at which he put them online because they weren't in print anywhere. Um, but I like those even more than I like the Sam and Max stuff for sure. Oh, I, I'll have to look into those because Sam and Max is, um, that's a high water for me in cartoony, funny stuff from like my, our, our era. Like, yeah. Hilarious stuff. I wish I could the, get the color versions of it. I only have the black and white reprint. Right. I don't remember the characters names in toy box, but there's one where they, they catch a, I think a Fiji mermaid, which is this grotesque little mermaid that they make wishes with. And, uh, it's just, it's really ridiculous. Like there's, there's a character in it who's a big walking ice cream cone and somebody wishes he would melt and he's got a skull underneath when he melts. It's, it's some, really good. He must have a thing about mermaids because I remember in Sam and Max there were pirates and they would they were capturing manatees because they thought they were mermaids to make them their right. their wives. Uh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. I uh exactly. But yeah, Art Adams here. There's uh Eddie Campbell, Bacchus. Are you a fan of um Campbell in general or specific stuff like from hell to me is my all time favorite, like Alan Moore, like serious graphic novel, I guess. From um, hell was rough, man. That was a long, long, dense thing. And I didn't read it until it was collected. Um, I like better Eddie Campbell's like kind of pseudo autobiographical stuff. The Alex um, stuff. The Alex stuff. Exactly. Um, I and haven't he, read I everything. Like, but I don't understand all the references and the slang and the jargon of like his college, the pub, yeah, yeah. college and stuff. But f uh, undeniably fun to read and like full of energy. In the I don't know who it all is either, but I like seeing other comic creators turn up and wondering who they are and knowing who some of them are. Like Alan Moore's in it and Bill Sienkiewicz. And, you know, it's, it's not, I don't know who they all are. There are characters in it who represent people who I'm not familiar with at all, but there's, there's something in the tone of those that I like a lot. I'm, I'm going. not, let's keep going. That's Charles Burns. Cor How, my favorite. It was, it was hard not to find a one that's instantly identifiable as him because his ink. Right. Style. Yeah. I mean, you could have gone with the, uh, the soda can, the okay. Cola. Oh yeah. The, I could have done that for Klaus too. Right. He did one of yeah, those. They did do those. Um, the, my favorite Charles Burns story is while I was in the uh, comic book store working, I looked outside the window and saw three furries, uh, people dressed up in like cartoon animal suits. And they were like cavorting on the sidewalk and people were taking pictures of them. And one of them was pretending to pee on a fire hydrant or something. And I just kind of thought, oh my God, I hope those – people don't come in here. And then I went back to working and forgot all about it. And uh, maybe half an hour later, three people came into the store with the tails from their fursuits sticking out of their pants. Like they were just wearing the tails and they were wearing, I mean, they were also wearing clothes, but of the fursuits, all they were wearing was the tails. 
And they were also wearing lanyards and badges from Anthrocon, oh, okay. which is like a furry convention. So I think I'm pretty sure that they were on their way back home from this furry convention. And they walked around and one of them came up to the counter and said, Hey man, you got that book that's about teenagers that get an STD that turns them into monsters? And I said, yeah, that's Black Hole, Charles Burns. He said, great, I'll take it. He bought it. They were super friendly, super polite. Uh, there was nothing bad. I felt wrong for having hoped they weren't going to come in the store. Yeah. I appreciated them taking their suits off before they came in the store. Um, I, I will know. say this about furries. They're always upbeat, positive people, the, one, the ones I've ever met. Like, that tail is wagging when you meet them, right? Yeah. <laughs> It was uh, it was not a bad experience at all, and I just loved the the conversation that happened. Uh, but yeah, it's you know somebody Charles Burns is highly talented and, and in a really obvious way. You don't have to talk about his work to to convince anybody that it's good. It's like sleek and gross and scary, like he wants amazing. it. It's amazing. Good stuff. All right, is that Kaluta? Good, good guess. Or Vess? Another gr great guess. Who is guess. it? Uh, I, I believe, I don't have the, his, his, the name here, but I believe it's P. Craig Russell. It's definitely P. Craig Russell. Oh, it's Russell. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Those two, cho those two names are great. This is, again, not typical Russell stuff. That, you know, I should have done like Ring of the Nibelung or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's fine. The... Um, yeah, a good artist. Um, not not one that I'm exceptionally familiar with. I would I would see his stuff when it showed up. I, I think he drew part of a S Starman annual or something uh -huh. that I was familiar with, but I didn't hunt his stuff down. I just kind of saw it. Um, I think money. he did some Spider-Man covers that were really great that I'm kind of thinking of. Marvel um, fanfare is what I think you might yeah. be thinking. I and think they, that's what that was. And that's what so, this is, I think. That was somebody I respected from afar, but uh, don't know a lot about. Okay, fair enough. Uh, obviously. Hey, there's Pete Bag, who we've talked about already, who drew yeah, him. Neat my all-time all favorite cartoonist. I just think it takes a lot of skill to draw in a way that looks like it's total chaos, sure. but it's so yeah. controlled. Well, there's a consistency about it too. Yeah, it's 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 and it's controlled. just fun. It's just fun. Yeah. And his storytelling chops when he does the serious stuff like he's doing now, his sort of women biographies that he's been working on, Fire yeah. and the other ones. Um, like just this story, the pace of the storytelling works so well, and his funny drawing just like make it more fun and interesting to read, even when there's not exciting stuff per se happening. Um, sure. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. I haven't kept up with him well that's Mignola um of course. who is one of my favorites for sure um the the Hellboy stuff more than anything else he's done but, and this is yeah. objectively not a not a pretty drawing not a not a drawing that really looks realistic not a drawing that is like super heroic in the classic manner but but gosh his 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 work just has such an impact maybe because it's so far removed from standard super sure standard. it's everything gets really flat with the big fat black colors um it's i mean if, by the time he got into hellboy he was doing way more of the flat blacks and less of the the line work there on the wall where the the cape or coat or whatever uh -huh. this version of batman wears fades into yeah. it, his yeah. the bottoms of his feet um like he he got more he got less detail oriented as he went and more chunky flat, big flat stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Simple, chunky, flat. This is good too. It's just that I think the stuff that came after is, is even better. I agree. This is early in his career, right? Or not super early, but this is when to me, when he really started to break out, this is when I started to notice and I started going, Oh, Mignola, like this guy's got it. Is this Gotham by Gaslight? I think pretty sure that's what this is from. Yeah. The I know that I saw his stuff. I I think the first professional thing he drew was the Rocket Raccoon series. Okay. And it doesn't doesn't look like his later stuff. In fact, it looks more like 
Craig Russell. Um, you know, yeah, it's right. more liney. Right. And it's like, I definitely had that because I liked funny comics and animal comics and like that. Um, and I saw other work that he did. The first time I really noticed his stuff and said, I really like this is the issue of X force where Rob Liefeld drew the framing story and he drew a flashback. I don't know. Um, if I read that. So I think it's number eight or nine and it's just, I think Rob was busy. You know, he, he had drawn a bunch of comics in a row and this one was basically the first few pages and the last few pages, cable and domino yelling at each other. Do you remember this? And then, the middle was Mike Mignola drawing a flashback story. And, hey, I thought and this was, was this was the first ever Elseworlds story. Is this too. Gotham by Gaslight? Yeah. Did I For whatever say that already? Right. Yeah. It spawned a whole universe of phony baloney comics. Right, yeah. He did that. He did the uh, Cosmic Odyssey. Uh -huh. uh, I can't think of what else he did. Did he do a Wolverine? I think I'm trying. He, did. To me, he really didn't break out until this stuff, and then right. of course, once Hellboy started, it was like, oh, okay, this guy's obviously a master. A master, yeah, definitely. Speaking of masters, there's, yeah, there's Jim Woodring. Um, Jimmy Frank. I I was big into him when I was in college. Um, he was one of the first kind of alternative indie cartoonists that drew comic books that I really got into the uh, with the real first ones I really got into being Matt Groening and Linda Berry, whose comics were serialized in local news weekly. Um, I'm glad you said that because I meant to bring up that when I look at meeting comics, that's what comes to mind. Isn't all the format, the square format, yeah. the four panels, it's clearly, it's coming, it's, it's drawing on that alt-weekly form. Sure, of it is, but that's, it. I'm sure I'm thinking of that, but that's an accident. The reason it's a square is because of Instagram. Um, ah, interesting. That's, that's basically. But I'll, I could, I'll talk, it would be at home in one of those alt-weeklies, you know what I mean? Like it would format-wise, it would fit right in there with From Hell and. and uh, yeah. And I've considered approaching some. Um, I'm I'm not working hard on pushing to get my comic out there more than it's just happening. But I do have plans to see if I can maybe make that happen in, in some way. Because I think you're wait right. It would work interview. that way. Wait till this interview drops, Andrew. And then oh, the deal. Boom. It's okay. We're exciting. all we've got a few more. You're doing awesome so far, by the That's way. That's Evan Dorkin. And this was an obscure Evan Dorkin-ish kind of thing, but like just the quality of his line work and stuff, to me, it's, it's I, I think he's an unsung hero too. He's a modern master. Oh, he's great. He's great. And um, he's not drawing much now, I don't think, but the comics he's writing are good. The, the um, Bisa Burden yeah. that uh, Jill Thompson drew some of, mm -hmm. and I, is it Ben Dewey who's done the later stuff? Those are good. Those are good comics. And they're um, starting to collect his earlier stuff in nice formats, right? Milk and cheese, oversized hardcover, the dork hardcover and stuff yep. that's coming. Really gives his work the attention I think it deserves because he's he's yeah, he's, and he's, he's worked in Besser to Crumb and, and and the underground guys, I think, too. Right. And he and Sarah Dyer, his wife, have worked in cartoons. Yeah. Uh I, I know they worked on the Superman animated cartoon. Uh so you know they've they're both fantastic. Is that now? Let's get fanboy. Is that Cassidy? You see, you knew it in a second. I knew you're a fanboy, dude. I knew, you know, you know the superhero guys, the good ones anyway, as well as you do the indie guys. And I've always said that about people who are true comic fans. Like that doesn't really matter. You can love Superman and Captain America comics when they're really, really well done. Sure. Yeah. This isn't. I I feel like. Uh... Well, also, to be fair, uh, the guy who wrote these, John Reber, lived near me, so I helped him oh. find comics for research. Um, so I, w I was totally aware of Cassidy doing this. My favorite thing he was involved in is Planetary, which of course, is you know, a really good pulp science fiction comic Amazing. written by Amazing. Warren Ellis. Yeah, um, but yeah, yeah. 
But Cassidy's artwork is a, it's a cut above. Like it's, it's got a photo reference quality to it, but at the, st at the same time, it's undeniably like hand drawn. Like the guy's got chops as an artist. Yeah. I haven't seen anything that he's done recently. I don't know what his stuff looks like now, but the, the planetary stuff for sure was big for me. Yeah. Okay. That's Ivan Brunetti. Yeah. This is one, one of, I thought you might know. One of the least horrific comics. <laughs> He probably I, dude, I had to, so hard to come up with this one. Yeah, like, this was the most family friendly that I could really find. Everything else was raping babies and, and and whatever else. But he's another guy where, like, dude, the quality of his drawings and the humor, like the subject matter, is disgusting. Obviously, ultimately grotesque and right. And horrible, but man, I can laugh my balls off, and I can read these comics and really love them and enjoy them on a on an aesthetic level too. Yeah, I think he's a professor primarily now. He teaches yeah. comics, yeah, uh, and I, and he's done a book about making comics that I haven't yeah. seen yet, but I think it's kid appropriate. Um, you know, it's it's a. Uh, I think he's found a situation in which he's able to be involved in comics and making comics that's working well from what I understand. I don't know him personally, but it, it seems that way. Sounds like a little bit like you, Andrew. Wow. That's uh, guy. Yeah, what's that guy's name? Yeah, O'Neill. Yeah. Kevin O'Neill. Yeah. Uh, um, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, obviously great stuff, yeah. but these martial laws are overlooked classics in my mind uh, amazing comics i those are 2000 ad comics right the, no 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 they're not okay. in fact the first one was published by marvel okay i like epic got it yeah i i never got into those i think his art's interesting um the when i did started, read it was, when it started from marvel it was almost it wasn't so funny. It started out as like a kind of right. dark superhero, like all uh, uh, a post-apocalyptic future, whatever, with some humor in it. But then right. as it's gone on to now, it's a complete parody, 100% parody comic of superheroes and stuff, and it's right. hilariously funny. That's uh, Rick Geary, right? Yeah, man, you know, you know, I love it. I love it. I love this guy. He's done, he's, he's the most like outsider of comics, I think. Like he doesn't, obviously doesn't draw superhero comics, doesn't draw, he's drawn like a Gumby comic and a few other things, but like those Victorian murder comics he did and so many other things. He's more of an illustrator in my mind. Right, yeah. Those comics are basically like true crime history comics. Um, but his, his, uh, I don't know, his, his art style is very specific. That big fat line and that, weird kind of bumpy edge to it yeah he's i mean it's good it's not it's not what i'm excited about for the most part but it's highly skilled yeah that's joe sacco yeah joe sacco i bring try to bring him in because i i just wish he would do more comics more often yeah obviously it takes a lot of work to draw this kind of stuff like a, not, not just to go out and research it and go there and do the things but then to draw at this level this yeah. must be a lot of time it's, you know, those are good. Those are the, I think they were always promoting them as uh, comics journalism as opposed to just biography or memoir or nonfiction. Um, they always put journalism in the description of these, and I thought that was okay. an apt way of putting it. The, uh, but, yeah, those are solid for sure. Love it. I love the guy. All right, we're, almost, we're almost wrapping it up here. We're almost there. This is going to be tricky. Because this is not the subject matter he would be most associated with. Yeah, I know who this is, but I don't know who this is. Um, yeah. Who is it? Just tell me. It's, it's it's Mobius. This is from from uh, from Blue Blueberry. Blueberry. Yeah, this is the this is the stuff. You know, if I put on the, some Azark stuff or whatever, it would be so. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously him. But when you go like you can go like look at his sci-fi stuff, and you go, man, it's it's cool, but it's all it's not real. It's all out of his head. And this stuff right. is so highly specific, time period appropriate, beautiful. Stuff. Yeah, I never actually read more than maybe one little book of Blueberry. Um, yeah, me either, but I just love to look at them. Fair enough. Okay, I think this is our last one. 
That's Dave Cooper. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think of Cooper? You've been reading? I was a huge fan of Cooper during the, when he was serializing Weasel. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the comic that he did that I think was collected as Ripple later. But mm-hmm. the first is, you know, I really, I really think the art is fantastic. Um, he's gone more like loose and fluffy and painterly. Yes. And it's good, but I don't like it as much, but I'm happy that he's doing a thing he likes to do. Um, I think he's a really good artist. The, my favorite thing, honestly, from those comics and the reason I never replaced them with the ripple collection is there's a comic in one, a backup by Pat McEwen, who's one of my favorite cartoonists of all time. And he didn't do a lot of stuff, but it's in the first issue. I think of weasel, there's this comic, that is uh it's a building and you read it you read the comic not panel by panel but you read the direction the characters run through the building oh, to see okay. yeah. what they do and i don't think you even finished the comic like it's penciled all the way through but only part of it is inked and then in the next issue there's a or maybe the third there's a like a maybe a four panel comic explaining why Pat McEwen hasn't been back and he's being tortured by some villain. But the, uh, he also drew the first zombie world series, uh, that was like a thing that Mike Mignola thought of that was going to be this big, exciting, uh, multi author shared world zombie comic in the nineties. And the one that Pat McEwen drew looked like basically a 10, 10 horror comic. Um, I loved it. Like, so I like I like Dave Cooper, but my favorite Dave Cooper thing is that he had like a short Pat McEwen comic in that. <laughs> in that I, first I loved issue. his appearance in the Crumb movie where they were looking at like his puke and explode comics or his gun oh, okay. era stuff. I have not seen that movie since the college I was in in the '90s showed it. Uh, so well, there's a I don't where Crumb's in a comic comic book shop and he pulls up like puke and explode or whatever. Okay. He's just like, he's so against it, but it was just ironic because there's not, there was probably nothing better in the shop that he could have picked. Uh, well, there's a, there's a Dave Cooper interview from the comics journal where he talks a lot about that early stuff that he did. I think Pat McEwen actually conducted the interview, um, but it gets into how, like I think he did all that stuff with Air Cell, like working for Barry Blair. <laughs> yes, he those. did. If have you read Dan and Larry? Is that the one that Gavin McInnes wrote? Like this guy who's this like modern neo Nazi guy. I know who that is. Is uh, I knew he was a founder or one of the original people who worked on Vice Magazine. Yeah, but he yeah, did a comic. He did a comic with uh, Dave Cooper. Uh, it might be Dan and Larry. It might be – I don't think it's Dan and Larry. It's Pippin Norton maybe. Oh, okay, yeah. But, like, wow. I knew that guy's name from having been involved in a comic way before he was famous for being a piece of shit. Um, yeah, yeah, well, and Barry Blair too. Like, the whole Dan yeah. and Larry comic is all about how Barry was just kind of like an alleged pedophile and, like, really – Super, super. It's horrific. There's a lot of really horrific real world stuff, I think, that informs Dave Cooper's work and is part Absolutely. of why it's so so gross, you know? Uh, because I got it's... one more artist, though. Okay. And this is one that I picked because I added for you because I thought I saw an influence in your comics. It's, uh, it's one of those Linnea Claire guys whose name I can't remember. Um, just it's, it's what's that used suerte yeah Just. yeah um good stuff um i thought kevin i thought the design of kevin l- reminded me a little bit of like that pojo de jopo no that makes a lot of sense actually i hadn't thought of that the um i like a lot of french cartoonists but i tend more toward the even more cartoony uh yeah. The uh, who did Gus and his gang and Isaac the pirate, uh, Christoph Blair, um, like that's a a big one for me. But yeah, no, this is good stuff, and I can totally see why you would think that. I haven't consciously thought of it 
and I might not have read enough of this to have much of it in my mind, but I totally see where you're coming from. He's more about design to me than he is comics. The comics are actually decent and good storytelling and everything else, but yeah. like the picture itself, the design of it and the fact of the way it draws your eye in different directions to tell your, the story through the mirror and the different directions of the eyes and stuff. To me, this is just a design miracle. I love this picture. Yeah, so it's good. Cool. Well, Andrew, we're about out of time. We've used up a lot of time. We talked about a lot of stuff and uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad that we did. Uh, this has been awesome. I love to see, I love to talk to the people that were there. Uh, at the same time I was in the, in the comic retailing biz. And honestly, there's nobody who's got a, we know obviously we're different parallel paths and stuff, but like right, there's a right. lot of similarities between the experiences that we had in comics. Um, yeah, I think so. The, uh, I think there is a lot there that, that we've both sort of done the same way. Um, we don't have the exact same, interest in specific comics but right. I, but we have but we have the overlap we were reading at the same time that's right um, and, and, and i think a love and a passion just for comics just to love them because they are what they are is, yeah definitely um it's, it's i don't see another person i don't see another way to get into comics retailing unless you have that because if you don't have that god help you on your mental i don't know why someone would want to it's it's strange to me it's yeah. It's not like there is a good way to make money, period, these days. It's not like there's a thing you can just choose if you want to be a money-making guy, necessarily. But comics is not, is not the one. Comics, <laughs> it, it, I mean, I don't think it's that way for cartoonists. I don't think it's that way for retailers, except for the, you know, a, a small percentage of all of it. You know, the person who's able to make money doing that is rare. And I think some of it is love, but some of it is also ability and some of it is luck. I was very lucky. Actually, um, that's, that's so true. Probably the biggest factor in most of these things is, is luck. Um, I Sunday. mean, the timing was perfect for me, not just for where I was. You know, when I bought the store, I was 28. Uh, I was not capable of being a grown human before that. Right. If, it had, if he had decided he wasn't going to run that store anymore, three years earlier, I don't think I could have done it. The, if it had happened, if I were younger and in the same situation, 10 or 15 years later, I don't think the market was in a situation for me to get into it. Like it was a good timing. It was coming back from the bust that had happened before there was growth in comics. Uh, it was before things kind of fell back down again. I think, I just think the market is really confusing now. And well, I think what's happened since then is the media market in general, like putting comics as just part of it, yeah. has flattened. And there are so few middlemen. Like, now, how could I have a video talk show about comic books before? You know, like, it didn't... Right. How could you publish a comic yourself and get a, a, a pool of people to support you on an ongoing basis, right? These digital... Um, uh, innovations have brought about kind of a renaissance, in, uh, in my opinion, of people being able to create art and communicate it directly to an audience. Sure, that's absolutely true. I'd say that they've also kind of increased competition for everyone. I mean, more people are able to share their work, and that means there's more work out there for everyone. You know, you're not going to have to settle for a thing that isn't what you want these days you're going to probably be able to find something that you want like when we were buying comics in say the early 90s and i've talked about this with other people before if you bought indie comics you bought the same indie comics as other people you know you whether you liked hate or eight ball or james kachalka or whatever you bought that because it's part of what there was and there wasn't a lot of it well, and because the publishers were the gatekeepers. Exactly. And, right? And, and they could just, and then the distributor level, and then the store is the final. You had to get through these, all these gatekeepers. Exactly. To see the and comic. now, you know, there are more venues for, for showing your comics to people. I put mine on Instagram and on other places. Yeah, I'd say Instagram because that's the place where most people who read yeah. it, read it. Yeah. Um, I have a Patreon where... People give me a little bit of money to either get copies of the print comics or just read it a week earlier than everyone else. 
Um, I put it on other social media. Facebook is basically people I know. Uh, and then Twitter is, I might as well put it there while I'm doing other stuff because I don't really use Twitter. Um, then I do print copies of the comics. I sell them in some stores. Uh, it's really small print runs, but I like having a print edition. Um, I've had to reprint the first couple and it's, that's fun. You know, I go out and do zine festivals and comic events and like that. Now that I've got enough to actually show up and not just sell one $5 comic. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of part of it is you're building this backlog of things, right. That you can continue to sell. And it's, it's very similar, um, uh, to say in the YouTube world where right, we're making these videos, right. And they get out there, but they have a life of their own after the fact. Right. Some of them will go nowhere, but some of them might continue to live on and, and, and go big. Yeah. I'm hopeful at some point, And I can't really plan for this because I guess you could plan for it. There are people who plan for this and make things like this happen. Like that kid who did the, uh, that, uh, country rap song who worked so hard to make it viral like uh you know he th- th- that thing that thing went viral because he made it go viral it's you know it kind of bumps too i don't hate it but uh okay. it it wasn't just that it's uh you know it would be great at some point if something of mine receives some level of attention that bumps up the 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 attention i feel like a lot of my comics are actually good you know for the first time in my life drawing comics i read this thing i go oh these are pretty solid i think there's an audience for this and the way i'm building the audience now slowly one person at a time i'm very happy with but i don't know if i would have been happy with that when i were young right because i because i would have been trying to do it as its own thing i'm doing it as I work a job, I don't have to have this be where my money is coming from. It's not like I've walked away from everything. I found a way to fit it in with the other things I do. And sure. It's a classic, it's a classic passion project. Right. I I feel about my, this YouTube channel. I'm I'm not going to make any money off this thing. It's in fact, it's costing me money if you count my time, but man, I love doing it. It's so fun. It's great to talk to guys like you talk to people about the industry and, and man, I want to thank you again, Andrew. I hope that, I don't know this interview is going to make any kind of difference or dent for you, but it made a big <laughs> yeah. difference for me. I super appreciate you taking the time. I hope that you'll maybe send some links out to some of your uh, people and, the, and I'll send my links out to my people and we'll yeah, know, yeah. try to get attention for each other. I mean, it's always good to talk to you. It's been a long time since I've seen you. So yeah. it's great to catch up, even if it's not really catching up, even if it's yeah. just, uh, this which is great Shooting i've had a good time talking about comics there's not too many people we can talk about i can talk about comics at this level with right at well the industry art form at, you know all those different levels I, so it's it makes me feel no good. there's something to be said for that i don't have to someone doesn't have to have the comics connection for me to be a friend right. um i have a lot of close friends who don't know a thing about comics but there's having somebody that I can speak to as a human and who has that, uh, some overlap of comic knowledge and interest. It's always good. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. I hope maybe someday we'll do this again. Maybe we can talk again of just about comics in general or some other topic. If you've got something you want to promote, you've always got a spot back here. You can come to me and we'll. All right. Yeah. When I sell meeting comics as a Netflix show, I'll, uh, I'll come back. I'm ready, baby. Okay. <laughs> Andrew, Neil, thank you for taking the time. And uh, I, I'll, I'll talk to you soon, I hope. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, you might like some of these other videos. So check them out. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And ring the bell if you want notifications of new videos.